Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our another round of uh, fellows talks. Uh, first up, we have uh, Artem. Artem, whenever you're ready, you can, get, you can go ahead and get started. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Artem Tehavrilyuk, and today I'm going to tell you about my summer experience with Iris Hep and specifically with the Alpha team from Davidson. Before I begin, I would like to express my deep gratitude to my mentors, uh, Michelle Kuchera and, and Rahul Ramanujan, for the support they provide me. Uh, they are the best. I don't think that they are here now because they are very bu busy, but uh, it's okay. Uh, I was working on a project called uh, using diffusion prob prob with prob probabilistic models for generating tracks from a TTPC detector. Uh, a TTPC de de detector, in a nutshell, uh, it consists uh, of a chamber filled with gas, a window through which particles fly in, and a detector surface that re re register the impact. The experiment occurs as follows. A certain particles fly through a window into a chamber filled with gas. This particle can disintegrate, and the products of this decay can ionize the gas that fills the chamber. As a result, electrons appear, which under the influence of electromagnetic field are attracted to the detector plane. The detector records the X and Y coordinates where the electron hits its charge and the time of impact. Knowing the time of entry of a particle into the chamber with gas and all the parameters that I mentioned, it's possible to recreate a 4G track of the decay products of the original particle. These tracks look like this. Uh, on the left is a two-particle experiment, that is when an income particle decayed into two, and on the right is a three-particle experiment when a particle decayed into three. So. I will scroll. So you can see it's two lines. So it means two particles, uh, you know, one line, uh, another line. And for three particle experiment, you have something like this. So one line, second line, and the third one, one second, third. So they are quite easy to distinguish by eye, which is why we chose them for training the model. Uh, our goal is to generate unique, realistic tracks from the TTPC detector as the final goal of our project. This is a generation of experiments that have not yet been carried out. So we want the model to take as input the name of the particle that flies into the chamber with gas, as well as the name of the gas with which the chamber is filled. And the output of the model should be the generated tracks that arise with this configuration. Uh, also, the re realistic tracks that were generated by our model can be used to train another model, uh, the purpose of which is to remove noise from the point cloud. In the picture on the left, you can see a clean synthetic track, and uh, in a real experiment, you never have this. Uh, and in the picture on the right, it looks more real. And you need to understand that every real experiment in includes a certain amount of noise, uh, which is uh, which is uh, desirable to get rid of. And uh, in our research, we relied on a 2021 article called Diffusion prob prob Probabilistic Models for 3D Point Cloud Generation. In, in this paper, the authors used DPM to generate 3D structures like this. As they use ShapeNet as a data set, which consists of point clouds in the shape of chairs, sofas, airplanes, cars, etc. It's worth noting that using the ShapeNet data set is a common practice when it's necessary to evaluate the performance of a model for generating 3D structures. But there are two problems to this article that we need to work on. The first is uh, that in this work, the generation of 3D structures was carried out while we needed to generate 4D structures, you know, uh, and one of our team members de dealt with this uh, problem. The second problem is the lack of conditions for generation. In the article itself, the artist emphasized uh, that they were able to implement generation with conditions but the truth is uh, different. They simply use different models for different types of objects. So 
uh, if there was uh, 10 objects, they needed uh, 10 models to generate each one of them, which is inconvenient. Uh, and I need to deal with this problem. Why DPM? Uh, in short, this type of model is currently showing excellent results in various generation sectors. Uh, if you talk about 3D generation, then this model, judging by standard metrics such as CD and EMD, is superior to their competitors. CD is chamfer distance and EMD is Earth's mover distance. Uh, CD, in a nutshell, is just summation over all the distances between uh, how to say between the nearest neighbors, and EMD is too complicated to describe it in two words. So you need to trust me. Uh, uh, and uh, all of these uh, results can be seen in this picture, where the results that corresponds to the DPM mo model are marked in bold. So this dark. Uh, that, that is why we decided to try to adapt the DPM model for generating for these structures. A little about DPM itself. Uh, as you know, each model consists of forward and reverse processes. The forward process for the DPM model is to gradually add noise to a clean image. So we have a clean image, we gradually add noise, and we have a completely random point cloud. The reverse process consists of recreating the original image from pure noise, like this. Uh, that is, we teach the model the inverse diffusion process, or if we consider the process of adding noise as a Markov chain in this etap, uh, then we want the model to learn the inverse Markov chain. And that's it. Uh, it's also worth focusing on generation with and without conditions, uh, because it's critically to understand uh, uh, the novelty of what we are doing. If you follow the unconditional approach in left hand, uh, as the authors of the 2021 article did, then you are faced with the following problems. Imagine that you want to teach a model to generate images of cats. You take a data set with cats and put it into the model. It pulls out certain characteristics from these images on the basis of which it builds an idea of the object that you want to generate. Then it will generate cats for you without any problems. But uh, the problem comes when you want to have one model for generation cats and dogs at the same time. Uh, you see what the matter, uh, the model doesn't understand what cats or dogs are. It only sees a set of images from which it needs to extract uh, characteristics and then generate a new object. And if you put images of dogs and cats into the same model at the same time, then it will cope with this task perfectly. It will pull out some characteristic, combine them, and the cat dog like this will appear to your attention. And this is not what we want because we need separate dogs, we need separate cats, not a cat dog like this one. Uh, the conditional approach is that in addition to the image, you need to you feed the model a specific tag that matches the given images. That is, with images of cats, you send the tag cat. With images of dog, you send the tag dog. Uh, and the model already understands that cats and dogs are different objects and their characteristic cannot be combined. Uh, and this way you can get one model that generates different objects, different cats, different dogs without any problems. So this, one model for different types of objects. And here you have different model for different types of objects. That's the difference. Uh, our plan to achieve our goals is as follows. First of all, we need to adapt the model to generate 4D objects. Sec the second one is to check the operation on a data set with one reaction type, uh, namely without using conditions. So, Essentially, it's a, it's a repetition of the 2021 experiment, experiment only using our data. Um, then after this, we need to add the conditions, uh, then check the performance of the conditional model on a simple dat, dat, no, data set, such as lines and circles. Uh, we use a simple data set just to understand whether our new architecture works or not. 
it's like uh, it's like a litmus uh, test for testing a hypothesis you know uh, if this works then we can move on to the next stage such as check the performance on real data uh, on a data from real experiment then we need to fine tune then increase the number of types of reactions and uh, at the end it's generation the results of experiments that are not presented in the data set at all so here is uh, the results of our work uh, here you can see uh, a repeat of the 2021 experiments uh, only using our data on the left on this slide you can see a uh, uh, generation of two particle experiment you know we start with a completely random point cloud and with time model learns to recreate two particle experiment from pure noise uh, so in this slide it would be on but you know there is one line second line so we can say that uh, it's actually a two particle experiment from three particles situation is the same so and second from a completely random point cloud it creates something uh, with a uh, definite structure like uh, like three body experiment so it looks like this one track another track third track so it looks like a three particle experiment uh, from this we conclude that the model works and we can move on uh, here is the results uh, of generation of simple structures, such lines and uh, circles. So we start with with a random point cloud, and at the end we have line, and it generates line. And from circle we have the same situation from a completely random point cloud. It generates something similar to a uh, actual circle, you know. And we consider this stage to be successfully completed uh, and move on to the next stage, testing on real data. Here is the results for real data generation. So we took a two and three body dat dat no data set, we put it into the one model. And we have something like this. Uh, the generations, uh, they are not perfect yet. We still have a lot of work to improve them. But uh, I, as a person who has seen enough of these tracks, can already see the prospect. So for, three, for two body, we have something like this. You know, it looks like uh, one line. It's like another line. So it looks like two body. Uh, it also looks like two body. And it is, and is it? Uh, and for uh, three body, we have not so happy picture. But uh, uh, if you have an imagination, you can see that this line, this line, and this line looks like a three particle experiment. So um, uh, I would say, uh, as I said, we still have to select the optimal parameters, namely fine tuning, but it's something. Summary uh, The following tasks, uh, tasks were successfully com completed. Uh, uh, it's adapting the 2021 experiment to our data, namely adding another, con uh, another di dimension. Then it's conditional generation on a trivial data set, such as circles and lines and conditional generation on experimental data to tree body data. Our next steps will be the following. Find the optimal parameters, namely fine tuning, uh, increase the number of types of reaction and generate the results of experiments that are not presented in the data set. That's all. Thank you very much. If you have any question, you can ask. And I, I will be happy to answer. Uh, nice talk, Artem. Uh, any questions for Artem? <laughs> you got a fire comment, so I guess other people agree <laughs> <with> my assessment. So, <laughs> no, it looked like great, great work. 
thanks for uh, thanks for presenting it. Thank you, Gordon. All right, thank you, uh, Artem. Yes, uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, next up is uh, Atel. Atel, you want to go ahead and share yeah. your screen? Yeah. Uh, um, so, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Atel Krasnopolsky. Uh, I've been a an Iris Hub Fellow uh, for the summer and September, uh, and I've been working on uh, Julia for AGC, uh, which stands for uh, Analysis Grand Challenge. Uh, my mentors were uh, Jerry Ling and Alexander Held. Uh, let's first start with um, a quick recap of what uh, Analysis Grand Challenge is. It's essentially about um, columnar data extraction from large data sets, which means that we have certain columns in that data set and we extract that, then we process that data into histograms. We mostly have two types of histograms, but we also have um, quite a lot of different um, uh, so-called systematic variations, which uh, multiplies that number to like by, by a certain factor. So we have quite a lot of histograms that can be divided into two types. Um, and then we also build a statistical model um, and we have some statistical inference steps. There's also a machine learning step in the later versions of uh, AGC. And of course, there are relevant visualizations uh, for these steps. Uh, the entire pipeline looks kind of like this. Um, you can find more uh, in the documentation uh, by that link. Um, right. Uh, we did not implement that uh, machine learning part in Julia uh, because it was uh, not our primary goal, actually. Um, and it has been added in later versions. Um, uh, this is basically the pipeline for our reference implementation, uh, which is written in with Coffee, which is mostly Python. Um, so it's the Python based implementation. Um, yeah, so we skipped the machine learning part here. And um, also this, uh, like we didn't re-implement uh, the entire cabinetry and uh, the later uh, stages of analysis, uh, but I'm gonna talk about that a bit later. Um, but there's probably a question of why do we need Julia for that? And um, this slide has been actually migrating um, through different projects I've made that are related with Julia. Uh, so basically, um, Julia is a programming language that has been designed for uh, physics, mathematics, and uh, scientific computing. And that's why it's fast by design and not because of the packages like Python is. Um, uh, and it's also JIT compiled, which makes it even faster. Uh, it can ent interact with uh, C, Fortran, and Python. So if you have some sort of a pipeline with those languages, uh, you could probably integrate Julia quite well. Um, uh, it's also empirically proven to be efficient for 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 um, high energy physics. Uh, you can see that organization here. Uh, there's quite a lot of repositories there, uh, including one repository that is for a project that I made last year, which was also Julia related. Um, there's also this nice website um, for that organization. Um, uh, right, you can find some uh, lots of information there. There's also this recent paper from last year, from actually from this year, um, that kind of sums up all the things that has been um, made in Julia for high energy, for high energy physics, all the advances and uh, some further steps for Julia. Um, right. Uh, the chart on the right is basically the comparison of between Julia and other languages. There are quite a few issues with, with that chart, mostly that actually present Julia even slower than it, than it is, but uh, that still supports the point of this presentation. Um, right, uh, for this particular task, uh, Julia suited quite well. Um, the entire, like the main algorithm and the main looper uh, were implemented in less than a uh, hundred lines of code, which is not that actually, it's not a very big difference from the reference Python implementation. Um, 
where it was also about that uh like a hundred maybe uh, but the syntax is quite different of course um also yeah the, less than 100 is like including the spaces and comments and stuff like that on the right you can see that it's it's the entire main algorithm and it's like about 80 lines i don't know um uh right it also julia also has plotting distributed computing tools and uh basically working with all of that and complex data structures that it could not be easier um which really helped uh everything it is not very different from python in that sense except it's like way faster to do that um and you do not need like packages to, to do it faster um the syntax is ge and, and, and general experience are things that i just can't stop enjoying in julia but that's like a personal a, more of a personal thing um right uh you, it's probably not really intelligible on the right what the syntax looks like but uh, it's not really hard to to master that. <clears throat> um, as for a drawback that I can probably probably tell is like that some tools were a bit raw when we started, but all the issues that we had with them are already fixed by this point. So it's not really an issue anymore. There were also some issues with Julia last year during my like last project remember project project last year but uh they are also uh fixed and like long fixed uh so it is not really an issue anymore uh but anyways uh i'm talking like what i'm talking about here is basically that we had a package called um unroot and um it just could not work with root files uh remotely because of like a bug and that got fixed recently so there's no issue like that anymore um so let's talk about the results finally um we have the whole pipeline in um, implemented in julia except for um ml related parts um it's generating mostly correct like not mostly but correct histograms um up to bin migration bin migration is an issue that we actually did not bother fixing because uh, i've been told by my mentors that it's kind of inevitable that it occurs and it's basically uh the fact that uh, a few um there might be a difference in a few uh neighboring bins because of uh basically for floating point number precision uh, on the right, you can see comparisons between our reference implementation, which is Coffia and Julia, and you can see it's it's the same shape. Uh, you can probably notice that there is some difference in scaling here, but that's because uh, we like I, I use those images because those are saved images that I had, but uh, it's actually different weights that are applied here and here. Um, in reality, I tested like we have tests implemented that. Um, that's the difference between those histograms <clears throat> bin wise and the only bin wise difference that uh, we have there is due to bin migrations. Um, we also have a distributed version of uh, that algorithm. Um, it was my first time working with distributed computing actually. Um, and Julia has made that experience quite pleasant. Um, yeah, the scaling is up to you uh, to judge how, how good that is. Um, well, uh, my mentor told that it's possible that that's uh, that there's an outlier here and like that chart. It has been tested on the uh, cluster of uh, uh, the University of Chicago. Uh, so that's where we got that plot from. Um, Right. We also have convenient visualization tools, but um, Julia already has some plotting tools, some plotting packages. And the only thing that we needed to do is like um, uh, wrap those tools, uh, like basically define some recipes uh, to mimic um, the plots that we can get in a reference uh, implementation, but so that it's uh, actually usable in our, um, in our, um, uh, Julia format and uh, in, in the format that our main algorithm uh, outputs um, the data in. So 
uh, you can see illustrations of that here. It's successfully successfully implemented. Um, it, <clears throat> one can also uh, kind of uh, kind of create a workspace file, which is basically a JSON file um, of a very different format um, than uh, what we use internally. Um, it's basically a reverse format, and it's like it's very different. But there is a conversion that I implemented there. Uh, one can get that workspace file in a format that's compatible with um, cabinet re and PyHF. Uh, so the last steps of AGC can be performed uh, in cabinet re, um, even if you like uh, mostly uh, run that in Julia. Um, we also found some issues in the reference implementation, uh, specifically in the latest uh, stages of basically in the creation of workspace file in our reference implementation in that JSON file. Um, the reference implementation had a bug where it um, like um, it basically copied one thing where it should have been like another thing that should not have been copied. Uh, that's fixed uh, by now, and uh, we also uh, spotted a f like a certain um, well, a certain different uh, sign in in the code. It's just a minor bug that should not theoretically do anything, but uh, it did uh, make some difference. But we are not the only ones who who spotted that bug, I guess. Um, Right. Uh, so we also help the, the reference implementation uh, by, by doing that project. Well, I'm actually really thankful to, to Iris Hep and my mentors and well, the entire Iris Hep um, for the opportunity they um, provided. And um, it was my first time working with distributed computing, as I've said. And um, I also received some statistical insights about uh, how uh, the agency works internally, uh, and some other statistical insights. But well, I, I'm not that uh, proficient in statistics anyway, so that was actually quite interesting. And um, and of course, I, I learned more about high energy physics in general, uh, which is important at least for my uh, personal growing. Um, so yeah, um, thank you for your attention. Um, that was it. And uh, yeah, of course, I will be happy to answer all the questions that if, if there are any. Um, nice talk, Atel. Um, thank you. Sounds like, a, sounds like you had a great experience. This is, we like to hear that. So, um, Alex or Jerry, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I, I can uh, not it. really from my end. Okay. <laughs> okay, let me add one thing. Like I am super happy with uh, like how this project went and like how much we accomplished in here. Um so like thanks a lot as hell um for running all of this and also thanks a lot uh, Jerry for making that possible. I am personally not <laughs> at all an expert in Julia. Um so like we needed someone like, like Jerry to help out uh, supervise all of this. But uh, it's really nice um, to see now this AGC setup implemented in multiple different ways, which helps sort of compare approaches with each other. And it's really interesting to see how you approach things differently depending on the language. Um, and also, it was extremely helpful. Um, as, as you were describing, um, it helps us catch issues that we have in our reference that we implemented. Um, and like those arise and like those become noticed for people who really go into the details and Im implement this elsewhere. So I learned a lot personally, actually, about Julia and uh, about like other ways of approaching this. So this was super interesting uh, to me as well. And I'm really happy with uh, how far this got to have like a fully working implementation of this. So thanks a lot. Very happy about this project. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks again, Atel. Uh, next up is... Uh... Volodymyr. Okay, then I'll begin. Yes. Okay, so my name is Volodymyr Sintuselsky. I am from Trashevchenko National University of Kyiv. I'm actually the last year a master's student uh, at the nuclear physics department. And uh, during the summer, I've been working on the uh, beautiful project, which is called T-Track Extrapolation Model and Perspective Reconstruction at the Shorty One. And uh, my, pro 
my supervisor is Lorenzo Anguren and Prince Cashel from the University of uh, Valencia. And uh, let's move directly to the topic of my actually talk. So on the right hand side, you can see uh, the beautiful picture of all the tracking detectors at the LHCB. And as you can see, there are three of them. The, this is uh, the Velo Vertex Locator, UT. And then after the magnet, which is highlighted with that black line in the middle of that picture, uh, we have the three stations of the SCIPI detectors. And uh, the point is that uh, depending on uh, the, no, the number of uh, which detectors uh, particle uh, fly through, uh, the track, the corresponding track, uh, will have a different name. So, for example, if some particle uh, fly through all the three detectors, then it, it will leave the uh, so-called long track. Uh, but in my work in, and in this project, we've been focusing, focusing on uh, so-called T-track, so only on the tracks that uh, have hits only in the last uh, SCIPI detector, so only in the last uh, three AT stations highlighted on the right-hand side of that plot. So uh, let's talk a bit about the LHCB in general and about the T-Tracks. So why uh, they, they are so interested and what we are going to do with them. So let's start with the LHCB itself and uh, in particular with the high-level TV system. So the LHCB, as uh, any other big uh, high-energy high physics experiment, needs some kind of the trigger system in order to filter out uh, some interested uh, event from non-interesting one. Because we have uh, like, 40, like uh, 30 megahertz of uh, input data, which is equivalent to do the 5 terabyte per second of that data flow coming, from that, coming directly from the detector. And we obviously need to somehow filter out to be able to save uh, that data. And at LHCB, we actually have two uh, different three-year stages called HLT1 and HLT2. Uh, so my project was focused on the HLT1 trigger stage. This is the very first trigger stage. It is implemented on the GPU. And actually in the final setup, we have a couple of hundred uh, GPU uh, video cards installed in the system. And uh, using the so-called CUDA framework, uh, we are able to uh, write some algorithms, algorithms that can benefit from the uh, very high, high parallelization and therefore process our input data quickly which is exactly what we need, uh, taking our requirements. So this is about the trigger stage. And now let's talk a bit uh, about the T-Tracks itself. So uh, what's the point with this T-Tracks? So actually the point is that we have uh, the so-called long gluon particles. So what does this mean? Long gluon particles are the particles, at least in our, in our understanding, that fly uh, through significant, that fly a significant distance through uh, our uh, detectors. So, for example, if we take a look at the lambda, then we will see that uh, the 37% of the uh, lambda particles that are decays uh, into the two uh, T tracks. Okay, so they are decayed actually after the UT. And uh, this means that uh, if we want to include that, you know, decays that uh, tracks in our uh, final statistic, we obviously need some kind of the algorithms that uh, will be able to reconstruct uh, the T tracks and then uh, do some kind of the vertex in order you know, to reconstruct the combined particles uh, given the two input tracks, then reconstruct the lambda itself, all, all that stuff. So this is actually the idea. And the point is that apart from the lambda and uh, key short, which are present in the standard model, uh, this long linear particle reconstruction can also uh, benefit from some kind, uh, so from some, some kind of the uh, beyond standard model. Uh, process because there are some particles in the different model that also can you know, uh, fly for through, through the, uh, fly a significant distance through our detector. And therefore, we can probably in future with the solar grids reconstruct them and make some studies with them. So this is the idea about the T tracks, and uh, you know the point is that uh, the you know the idea of the whole project is just to develop the solar uh, for the HLT one stage, just to you know to be able to reconstruct at least something. Uh, and this is actually highlighted on this slide. And uh, once again, uh, we have uh, this uh, beautiful picture on the right hand side uh, with the pink color, which highlights actually uh, the region uh, where some kind of the long-living particle should decay uh, for it to be able to, you know, 
tur construct that f was to be able to construct that particle as uh, a decay into two t tracks. So this is actually the region of interest of my algorithm that I'm going to present in a few minutes on the next few slides. So this is the idea about the T-Tracks and uh, then apart from, the, from them, uh, we have uh, some kind of the challenges. So what I'm talking about, uh, the point is that uh, before the T-Tracks exactly at the, our uh, region of the interest, we have the magnet. And magnet uh, significantly uh, you know, bends our tracks and makes uh, our life way more complex in terms of the reconstruction of that uh, tracks. But also in addition to that, uh, just because the uh, magnet field in the uh, area of that uh, last Skify detector, uh, which is collided as T1, T2, and T3 on the right-hand side of that image, uh, we have the small magnet field there, and therefore we have uh, quite a poor accuracy in uh, the Q over P estimations, where Q over P is just a charge divided by the particle momentum. So this actually means that we don't have really a precise value of the momentum, and uh, without that precise value of the momentum, we need to reconstruct, uh, to extrapolate our tracks through the, uh, you know, through, through the volume with significant magnet field. And, you know, just the idea to do that is uh, already somewhat challenging because, you know, it's like an opposite in order to uh, reconstruct something through a significant magnetic field, you need to have a precise momentum to do that accurately, but we don't. So let's talk about, you know, the things, what we can do instead and what actually I did. All right, so let's start uh, with very, very simple thing. Uh, thing. So let's uh, take a look at just a single separate track. And uh, actually that uh, single track can be, you know, uh, modeled uh, with these two equations, uh, X versus data and Y versus data. So as uh, in the Adelish CB, we have the dipole magnet which uh, affect our tracks only in X, Z plane. Uh, the tracks in Y, Z plane are linear. So this is uh, this is simple and uh, you know, there are no anything about it. So we are simply leaving that as a linear. And then uh, in the X data uh, plane, uh, we need to you know, somehow take into account our uh, magnet field, our bending. And uh, I'm doing that with uh, that uh, F uh, versus something uh, addition. So this is actually uh, the function, some unknown function that I'm, that I'm going to find, and that will actually uh, describe our you know, binding, our particle binding in that field. And uh, then we can apply you know, some obvious constraints. So for example, if Q over P equals zero, which equivalent to the momentum, to very, very big momentum, uh, then the effect of that uh, f correction function should be uh, you know near the zero. In, should, in, in ideal case, it should vanish. And the same case uh, when, for example, our data equal to the data skify because of the uh, the data skify we obviously have uh, you know the exact uh, x and y coordinates of our tracks, and therefore there shouldn't there shouldn't be any kind of the correction there. And uh, this was actually the idea behind uh, that constraints. And I have actually implemented them by simply re redefining the function f as uh, this product of the QRP by data minus data zero, and uh, then some unknown function j. And then in this case, we automatically will satisfy that constraints on the QRP and on the data. And now we need to somehow you know, find uh, what that function j looks like actually. And uh, the good idea is that we can uh, uh, use the, our Monte Carlo data in order to find uh, exactly the value of j and uh, derivative of j versus theta. And this is how it looks like. So uh, I decided to simply fit uh, this dependency with the sigmoid function. And uh, this actually pretty uh, good choice simply because it uh, you know, satisfies uh, our behavior uh, on uh, on the on in the limits so what do i mean i mean when for example we will uh, take a limit one zeta equals to the plus infinity so obviously the uh, that fu function f should go to the zero it should vanish because uh, we don't have any kind of the magnets after the skip we have magnet only before the skip therefore after the skip we should not have any kind of the effect and uh, this is exactly provided by uh, this function sigmoid so actually the that sigmoid will go to the zero as zeta goes to the infinity. 
and vice versa. If you will uh, move into the opposite direction, so to, to the minus infi infinity, uh, then it should go to the some kind of the constant simply because you know we are flying through the magnet and then uh, as magnet as the magnet field is placed in some you know finite volume, then if you go to the minus infinity, then at some point we should not you know, have any kind of the effect of, of that magnet if you go uh, far enough from that magnet into min in minus infinity direction. And then this constant simply will uh, turn out in uh, just LNR functions so or just LNR uh, track in its that uh, plane when that goes to the minus infinity. So just from this, uh, you know, the limits, uh, we can already understood that uh, this is quite, uh, quite a good uh, approximation of our X data uh, tracks. Uh, and in addition to that, I actually decided to introduce a few other uh, correction factors, though they, they are mainly uh, an R1. But uh, the point of that correction factor is factors is, is simply to reduce the spread of that uh, you know, fitted function j versus zeta versus the data point. So just to make the things a little bit more accurate, I introduced two additional factors, and that's it. And in the end, uh, after I make uh, the global fit over all the coefficients, I get the this resolution in x uh, original vertex position as well as on the slope in original vertex uh, position. So actually, it uh, means that we have uh, the standard derivative actually less than 10 millimeters, even smaller, uh, just to you know, in the x origin vertex uh, position estimation. Which is quite quite good. Okay, uh, so now we have some kind of the extrapolation model. What you can do about that, and uh, you know the obvious uh, application of this extrapolation model is simply try to uh, estimate the slopes of the of our tracks at the origin vertex with a little bit uh, better accuracy. So why does this matter? Simply because depending on the slope, depending on the accuracy of the slope at uh, the origin vertex, we, we have uh, like a different accuracy on our uh, mass uh, plots. We have a different resolution actually, actually on our mass plots. So in ideal case, if you have you know, exact uh, slopes at the origin vertex, you will, ha you will have uh, some very fine uh, narrow peaks in, uh, on our mass plot, which is actually pretty, pretty good. So this was, this was an idea and uh, you know, for for this, we have everything except the zeta origin vertex position. So, how do we uh, estimate the zeta origin vertex position? So, I simply decided to uh, create a small neural network uh, for this stuff, uh, which uh, actually has two layers and uh, 14 and 5 for nodes in each layer. And with uh, the input specified there, and in the end, it gave me uh, the results on this uh, plot. So, the, the yellow histogram is actually the uh, bias in zeta origin vertex position uh, actually reconstructed by, by the neural network. And it gives me an error about like 600, 700 millimeters uh, in that. And uh, then after uh, doing that, you know, I understood that simply uh, this will not give me uh, much improvement in terms of the selection. So, uh, so for example, I can uh, accurate. I can more accurately, accurately reconstruct the mass uh, for given to t tracks, but uh, you know I need uh, the final goal is to uh, select the interesting uh, decays uh, from all from all the background, and uh, for for do, to do that uh, we need to uh, introduce some kind of the uh, useful variables like a his square, like I don't know, like mm, some additional information from the detectors and all that stuff. Because the more variables you have, the better selection you can perform. And uh, this was actually an idea. Uh, so to do some kind of the better uh, selection in the end, uh, we need uh, some kind of the fitting. Because if you will do the fit, we will have the his square. We will have uh, just the flag after the fit converged or not. And uh, you know, it will add us another variable to the actual selection. And uh, then on this couple of slides, uh, I'm going to explain the uh, fitting itself. So I'm trying to uh, do it quite fast because I see that I have only like a minute or two left. So really, I will try to do it really fast. So for example, we have uh, nine parameters in very general case. Uh, each uh, you know, decay into two uh, tracks can be described with the, with the nine parameters uh, specified in this slide. 
and then using my extrapolation model this uh, actually may be extrapolated to the SCIFI uh, plan where I can recalculate uh, actually the uh, prediction for the x at SCIFI position, y at SCIFI position, slopes and etc etc and then uh, using that uh, values of the SCIFI planes I can actually construct the histoire uh, using also the covariance matrix, uh, which was simply, uh, you know, found by uh, by definition using the Monte Carlo data, and uh, then by, by by performing the simple uh, linear field with the Newton Robson minimization method, uh, we can get actually something. We can make our field. We can you know optimize our model. But uh, this is the general case, and uh, in the end, it turned out that uh, for this uh, gen very general model with nine parameters with 10 uh, observables, uh, observable, observable uh, variables, uh, this, the fitting itself is very slow and also it's very complicated. It's going to be uh, very challenging to implement at the short one level where everything should be fast. But also it's, it is a bit uh, numerically unstable. So instead, I decided to uh, remove some of the variables and in the end, uh, I end up, ended up with uh, the parameter vector with only five different variables. And then uh, after I made the fit itself, I got a significant improvement in my P over P estimation, in my, uh, in my momentum estimation. So you can see actually the improvement on this uh, slide, where yellow is after the fit and the blue is before the fit. And uh, this is uh, the last... Uh, uh, plus in my presentation, so they are simply you know showing the result, the end result of my approach. Uh, so what is the idea? On the right hand side, we have the uh, mass plot for the lambdas uh, actually received at the HLT two trigger stage, and uh, on the left hand side, uh, you have the output of my algorithm, of my of my fitting, of my extrapolation, uh, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And it looks like this, and you know just by comparison the mass resolution. Of these two cases, we can uh, quickly understood that you know my algorithm works at least in this simple case, and it uh, it's worth to try to implement it in Allen and uh, in actually show you uh, one uh, trigger and you know check uh, this uh, different physics channels uh, what will help in the end. So this is actually the performance and. Uh, as I already said, uh, what uh, are the next steps? And the next steps are simply implementation of uh, all this stuff at the HLT1 level, and also some kind of the, uh, additional studies in order to uh, simplify the fit even further, and uh, to make it a bit faster, maybe to make it simply better. And uh, of course, the global uh, goal, the end goal, is uh, always the development of the selection lines itself, of actually the you know, the algorithms that will make a decision whether this particular event is interested or not. So thank you for your attention. And I'm sorry that I took so much time. I'm happy to answer your questions. Nice talk, uh, Vladimir. Uh, any questions? No. Okay. Uh, next up is. Uh, uh, My name is Kirillo. Uh, I've been working on uh, S3 interface for Rusio projects. Um, uh, my mentors were Lucas Heinrich, Matthew, who is actually here right now, uh, Mario Lasnik, and Martin Barisitz. So, Matthew, you want to say something? Okay. Uh, just that it's been quite nice to have uh, Kulo be able to work on this project and also uh, quite a big thanks to both uh, Mario and Martin who uh, actually possess the technical expertise uh, on this subject or uh, I am more of the user side so but uh, I, I'll let uh, Kirillo take it away because uh, this is a nice talk perfect thank you yeah, so uh, let's step right in. I will first talk a bit about the agenda of my presentation. So first, uh, we need to understand what Russia even is uh, to then later 
understand why this project is even here. So then I will give a short overview of my goals and the, the project itself, talk a bit about the knowledge that was required for this project and my work, and of course the personal takeaways, because I learned a lot from this project. All right, so understanding the Russia. Uh, well, as you may know, uh, there are multiple experiments at CERN and the LHC, which actually produce lots and lots of data. And as you can see on this graph, the rate with which data growth grows is quite high. And at some point, the analysts just needed a system to handle all this data and to manage it. So Russia was introduced in around 2014, I think it was end of it. And this is essentially a tool for scalable data management, data replication to allow the data be on multiple sites to not lose it in case something happens, data distribution. Again, uh, the same thing, basically data provenance. Uh, so keeping the data nice and clean and making sure it's there and it is accessible. So that is basically Russia. And Russia is uh, composed of a lot of components. It's quite a big project. So there are clients, uh, you can use it using CLI. There is even a web interface. Uh, it consists of a server, which handles all the authentication. There is a REST API, and there are lots of core components and daemons, and also where the data is handled. But I think Rusha is not really responsible for an uh, actual like data handling. All right, uh, now let's see what S3 is. So S3 is a service by Amazon Web Services. It's basic, it basically means simple storage service that they came up with. And it is lightweight and easy, scalable, and really widely used nowadays for data science especially. So that was the reason why we chose it because uh, in some to some extent, it's actually easier to store the data in S3 than for uh, small experiments or for some small data sharing to trigger Rusio. And that's why uh, this project actually exists, is just to build small bridge between Rusio and S3 to allow users to put some data in the buckets of S3 and they can choose the storage that they want. All right, uh, the project overview and goals. So let's rewind again. Um, we need to interact with S3 directly from Rusia. So my first week was basically exploring the whole tool. Rusia, then uh, Minayo's MC. Minayo is basically a service that handles the S3 connection and provides a really nice interface. Then there is the tool that they have developed, which is called MC, basically a Minayo client to interact with this service, S3 API, which I have learned uh, quite a lot about, uh, of course, yeah, developed by AWS. And I've worked on preparing development environment, not that, not the big deal actually. Then uh, implementing basic data transfer capabilities between Russia and S3 which is the core of my project to make sure that you can actually create the buckets in S3 and uh, transfer the data. Then uh, I spent some time working on integration testing and credential extraction took a lot of my time, but we actually ended up going without it, which I will mention later again. Then uh, some additional features and yeah, working on GitHub issues, read documentation and stuff like that. So I worked on the project in the period from July 3rd to September 22nd. Okay, so the knowledge I needed to work on this project, it may seem that it's just 
knowing a bit about S3 and using the Python Boto3 library, and then understanding how Rusio works to trigger the proper core components for the project. But actually, it turned, uh, turned out to be a lot more than just that, because I uh, worked with it. I, it was my first time working with a Python script that was actually usable via CLI. Uh, I had to work a lot with the PyTest framework to work on the testing because uh, Rusia is a test, uses the principle of test-driven development. So I was connecting to my remote uh, Docker container and debugging the tests a lot. I also had to learn about generalist reusage and uh, work on the exceptions so that nothing breaks <clears throat> or everything breaks but properly. Uh, I had to learn about all the clients that exist in Rusio. Here I only mention uh, DAD client, which is essentially data identifier client and a download client. And it seems pretty simple, but if you dig deep into these clients, the amount of code base is quite huge, actually. And also, there is an algorithm in Rusia, which is called LFN to PFN, which is responsible for reproducible path naming when you provide a path to your uh, command to create a bucket, for example, you need to make sure that during the transfer of this path uh, to different elements of Rusio, it can still be reproducible later when you download it and because they have a lot of hashing and things like that. Okay. Uh, I also worked with loading and caching of S3 credentials. And again, I will mention it a bit later. And of course, it was uh, really important to understand how the code parts uh, work together in Rusio. So uh, some commands that I had to introduce, we first wanted to implement something like, uh, you can see here the first part, Rusio S3 make bucket, and then the bucket path. But we later decided to choose uh, to choose a different template for it and stick to this kind of naming where you have bucket create. And then the path, which was also slightly changed. Then uh, some other functionality, which is really important, is to make sure that this client that I am developing works with native Rusio download. So it has to somehow trigger, get triggered when you run download and then connect to S3 instance and download the data from the path you specified. And again, uh, yeah, the credentials. So it is really important because uh, I spent quite a lot of time figuring out how to extract credentials from Rusia, but it turned out to be not really possible because if it was possible, it would be a huge security issue. So we decided to go without that. And the idea now is that uh, admins basically give the access to the uh, S3 to users, and then users specify the yeah, endpoint URL and the access keys to access S3. They tell it to Rusio, and then they can use the interface. OK. So let's talk a bit about the general implementation of the client. Uh, as you might understand, there are lots of clients in Rusio, and not all of them are listed here. But the idea was to have S3 also as a client, which would make sense in the context of Rusio. And that's exactly what I did. So I worked on developing an S3 client. Uh, as you can see on the right, I shortened it a bit and took away all the code. But essentially, there are functions like bucket create, bucket upload, then uh, data identifier registration, which is really important. And it is the part that 
makes this project different from just using uh, some Minio client to access the S3. And then I also worked on configuration loading and some tests. Not all of them are here again. And this was a really important part again, because um, as I said, the project is developed in the test driven development style. So I learned a lot about writing tests and executing them and the PyTest module. Okay, so yeah, personal takeaways. Um, yeah, as I said, I learned a lot about PyTest, test driven development but also about the optimal architecture for big projects because Russia is absolutely huge. It has a lot of core components, as you have seen the one of the first slides. And then um, S3. I haven't worked with S3 before, but this was really interesting for me because it is something that is nowadays commonly used for management of your big data in a project. And then um, an important part was the credential management and the identity and access management. So we needed to make sure that specific users can access specific buckets. Uh, I also improved my Python knowledge. I learned about remote debugging using Docker for the tests because uh, again, Rusio has a server and you have to run uh, around 12 Docker, different Docker containers to make it work. And of course, I learned a lot about general Russia structure, but of course, a lot has to be learned still to fully understand how it works because it's uh, almost a 10 year old project that's constantly being improved and developed more. And of course, there have been so many other things that uh, contributed to my understanding of general, you know, programming and tools that I have used to work on this project. And that's pretty much it. So thank you for your attention. So my project was about um, implementing to be recorded analysis in cloud. Um, uh, my mentors were uh, Vasil Vasilov and David Lash. Um, okay, I'd like to start with a bit of an introduction about what uh, automatic differentiation is. Um, automatic differen differentiation is um, a method of um, di differentiating functions expressed as procedures. So in our context, uh, those will be functions uh, expressed as code in C++. Uh, the basic idea comes down to breaking up uh, the function into elementary operations like multiplication, addition, and so on, uh, and differentiating all of them uh, by standard calculus um, tools like um, chain rule and so on. Um, so this project was focused on reverse mode automatic differentiation, which um, means that we first make a forward pass. So we make a forward pass to uh, collect all the uh, intermediate values of all the variables used in the code. And then we make a backward pass uh, and um, we compute uh, derivatives of uh, uh, all the variables. Um, using those um, values of original variables that we collected on the forward pass. Um, okay, uh, then now I'd like to explain what CLAD is. Uh, so CLAD is also a tool for uh, performing automatic differentiation on uh, um, C++ code, uh, and specifically it works as a Clang plugin. Um, so a huge advantage that it brings is that you don't have to write any specific code uh, for it, uh, and you can use, you can just use your um, regular uh, C++ code um, here and just differentiate it. So you can take your existing C++ code. Um, okay. Um, now I'd like to explain what TBR analysis is. 
Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, in reverse mode autom automatic differentiation, uh, we need to store all the variables that are um, used in the function uh, to use them on the backward pass. Um, and uh, the blind, the um, like um, the obvious approach to this problem would be to just um, every time that we change uh, a variable, so every time we overwrite uh, a variable x, let's say, we got to store it. So on this example, uh, we would have to store it three times because we change it three times. Uh, but actually, we can make it a bit, um, a bit smarter uh, because um, you can notice that only um, the value um, that was overwritten here was actually used in a differentiable way here. So those um, the values that were uh, overwritten later were never used, and therefore we don't have to store them. And um, this is what TBR analysis is, and uh, this is what I perform basically. Um, so the way it is done is pretty obvious. We um, create um, just Boolean for every variable, uh, and um, it, um, we set it to true if um, whenever that variable is used, and we set it to false whenever it's changed. And uh, whenever we um, analyze uh, some changes of uh, X, uh, and that Boolean is true, it means that before changing X, we have to store it. And uh, if our um, Boolean is false, it means that we don't have to store it. This is the basic idea. So um, overall, my um, presentation is going to be uh, is going to consist of three parts. The first part is going to be about modes, um, which is uh, which are used for analyzing data flow. Let's say uh, the second part is going to be about var data. This is a structure that I used to store um, information about one variable. Um, and the third part is going to be about CFG, which is which stands for um, control flow graph. Um, so this is going to be about how I handled uh, control flow in my analysis. So uh, the first mode is marking mode. This is pretty obvious. So uh, on the left, you can see just um, Y uh, and a semicolon. Uh, here, even though we have Y here, it doesn't mean that uh, Y here does not um, affect anything in a differentiable way. Um, on the right hand side, um, we have um, this assignment operation and uh, we have x times x and um, x here is used um, in a differentiable way. So it affects um, the return value of the function in a differentiable way. So marking mode um, allows, uh, allows us to track whether um, whether our variable does anything meaningful um, for the result in a differentiable way. So, um, but actually, even if um, our variable might appear uh, on the right-hand side of assignment operation, doesn't does not necessarily mean that it's going to um, that the the value of um, that variable is going to affect the result of our function differentiable way because um, well for instance here um, you can see if um, uh, if we have like assignment of a linear expression um, actually for derivatives linear expressions um, um, well x and z would basically just disappear because that's what happens for linear expressions when you take derivatives um, and uh, when the expression is nonlinear, um, the original variable does not disappear. So it remains here. So we need a way to um, track linearity um, to make our analysis more efficient. Um, this is like a simple example of what happens in my analysis. So here we analyze the right hand side of this assignment operation. Um, plus um, does not affect 
linearity. So um, we still consider this whole expression linear, and therefore Z is uh, considered linear. So it appears linearly in this expression. However, when we get to multiplication, uh, we have a product of um, two non-constant values here, and therefore um, this uh, whole expression becomes nonlinear. So the, the um, result of this analysis is that Z is used here and X is not, uh, Z is not used here and X is used here. Okay, so um, now I'm going to talk about VAR data. Uh, VAR data uh, stores all the necessary information about one variable that we analyze. Um, so let's start with a uh, with an obvious example. So let's say we have a double X. As already mentioned, we just need one bool uh, to keep track of all the uh, information about X here. Uh, such cases are called I called them font type, which stands for fundamental type. Um, we might have object types. So uh, let's suppose we have a structure here that uh, has two fields A and B uh, with different types. Uh, and in this case, uh, X is cannot be represented by just one variable, um, by just one bool, I mean. Um, so for each field, we have to store a separate var data. So uh, for Aries, we have something really similar, but um, here um, we have to store uh, a separate var data for every array element and also for um, undefined elements such as uh, X, I, because um, at compile time, we cannot know if I is zero or two or whatever. Okay. Um, also, um, we uh, we need a separate type for references. Um, so, like for this reference here, um, uh, what was pretty natural here uh, was to just um, for this X, uh, we would store the expression that that um, a reference points at. Um, and um, not a separate uh, var data because obviously uh, that variable is not it's is not a separate variable. It's pretty much the same variable as y. Um, okay, now we get to control flow. Um, for uh, control flow analysis, things get a bit more tricky because um, for this block over here. For example, we don't really know uh, what, like uh, whether it would be part one or part two that will be um, actually executed um, when the when we run the program. So um, we should account for all the possibilities. Um, what I used here uh, is um, uh, first I broke up the code into elementary blocks with uh, a tool called Clang CFG. So CFG stands for um, uh, control flow graph. Um, so here we basically have uh, the block that corresponds to the part of the code that comes uh, before uh, this if statement, um, two branches that correspond to the blocks that um, uh, they're um, inside if and else statements and uh, the block that comes um, after our if statement. Um, what we have to do uh, here is first analyze the part that comes uh, before this uh, if statement, then uh, analyze um, those blocks separately. So uh, for each branch here, we should analyze, uh, we should store um, their own um, analysis information specific for those parts of code. And uh, after we perform analysis for uh, those two parts separately, we should merge them um, for the uh, block that comes after this. 
um, how should we do this? Um, so let's consider a simple example where we use X in a differentiable way uh, in this part over here, uh, and uh, we use Y in a differentiable way in this part over here. Uh, the tricky part is, once again, that we don't know what part of the code will be executed, uh, and uh, we should account for all the possibilities. Uh, and the safe option here uh, would be to assume that both X and Y were used. So this is the basic idea. This is how we merge branches. So we take all of the used variables from both branches and uh, place them in our um, resulting branch. Um, something really similar happens for loops. However, for loops, um, things get even more tricky because um, one of the successors of uh, a loop body branch is itself. Uh, and uh, we don't want our analysis to just go in loops over and over and over again through this loop body. Uh, and uh, however, I cannot um, explain how this problem is solved because this would basically take too much time. But uh, I would just mention that this involves some more complicated graph analysis. Um, OK, um, this is it. Any questions? Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I think I had a, a question. Um, uh, could you, uh, could you put to like slide two? Mm, yeah. So, um, you've mentioned, um, you mentioned like, uh, uh, reverse mode, which is, uh, I think it's the same as backward pass, right? Uh, um, not really. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, because well, my, my question was, uh, what's the difference between uh, the backward pass and like the back propagation and like, um, like that, that that's the common algorithm that's known. Um, well, or uh, if it's not the same thing, the question is like, what's the difference between backward pass and reverse mode? And then what's the difference between mm -hmm. that and the back propagation? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so first of all, backward pass is like a part of reverse mode automatic differentiation. Um, reverse mode uh, consists of uh, both forward pass and backward pass. Um, so uh, okay, right, let's right. See yeah, yeah. I, I got that um, right then. Uh, well, that's basically the same thing occurs in back propagation, actually. So, what's the difference yeah. between that thing and and back propagation, as it is? Well, um, as far as I understand, this is pretty much the same thing. But um, in this context, um, so um, the difference between um, like automatic dif differentiation uh, here uh, that we're discussing here and uh, the one that is used in, let's say, uh, TensorFlow is that this method is not like, um, um, it's not domain specific. So you can uh, feed any kind of functions, any kind of control flow, any anything you can program basically to this um, tool and um, it will differentiate it. So usually, um, when we're talking about, um, well, tools like TensorFlow, they are domain specific, and um, you um, you have to write some specific code for them, and you um, it doesn't uh, it cannot differentiate anything you want. Well, maybe that answers your question, but but um, I think uh, back propagation is pretty much the same thing. <laughs> okay, because like m my first guess was that um, back propagation is like about numerical side of the thing, but I'm not sure how numerical this thing is. Um, um, this uh, is not numerical at all. So okay, everything, all the, all the derivatives here are 
analytic except for maybe some functions that uh, cannot be differentiated uh, for some reason. Okay, thanks. Well, but those are basically exceptions. Okay, any other questions? Nice Hi, a super naive Go question. Um, have you tried Enzyme? Because, you know, just from the AD community, we keep hearing about other uh, available tools. So just, just wondering. Um, yeah, I have tried Enzyme and actually um, there is like a small competition um, going on inside CLAD team um, where, I mean, everyone wants to achieve um, the same efficiency as Enzyme. <laughs> I see. So but, currently, uh, Enzyme has some advantages. Uh, not in all of the tests, in some tests. Right. Um, but, but yeah. That sounds good. OK. Any other questions? Nice talk, Petro. Nice talk, everybody, today. Uh, thank you for all your participation. Uh, more soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.